convening the committee on judiciary and hawaiian affairs it is tuesday april 6th at 2 p.m in conference room 325 first on the agenda we have sb 404 hd1 relating to electioneering communications uh, first up we have the campaign spending commission in support thank you vice chair chair members of the committee my name is gary cam and i'm here on behalf of the campaign spending commission uh, the commission uh requests that the committee restore the language of SB 404 as passed by the Senate. Uh, as that was how it was originally introduced. For the sake of public transparency in political spending on advertisements, uh, the commission urges the committee to not uh, completely exempt candidates from having to file EC statement, as this committee did to SB 404's companion, HB 144. Uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, other than that, I stand on our written testimony in support. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have Common Cause Hawaii in support. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee, Sandy Ma for Common Cause Hawaii. We stand on our written testimony in support of SB 404HD1. We also suggest that the amount be raised originally from $2,000 in HRS section 11-341 to $3,000 to trigger electioneering communication disclosure. We think that raising it from 2,000 to 3,000 will allow for a good balance of transparency and, and accountability, especially for, small, for smaller county council races and uh, to balance uh, the um, uh, burden on the campaign spending commission and we also concur with the Campaign Spending Commission in saying that uh, we need candidates and candidate committees to be continued to su be subject to electioneering communication disclosure requirements. I'm available to answer any questions. Thank you very much for allowing us to testify on this measure. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, that's all the testifiers we have. Any questions? Rep. Nakamura. I have a question for the Campaign Spending Commission. I wasn't here when this electioneering communication uh, law was passed, but you know, candidates um, have to report all expenditures to the Campaign Spending Commission uh, based on um, uh, requirements set by the Campaign Spending Commission. And then this is an additional requirement to submit these forms. And wh what is the purpose of this? Um, Oh, uh, uh, thank you, Representative. Um, first of all, let me say that the same requirements also apply to non-candidate committees, that they have to file regular reports with us as well as uh, do the election and communication statements of information. Um, this is, uh, this kind of filing is actually more timely because uh, while if it's amended to, uh, uh, if the disclosure date is amended, then it will be, the report will be required 24 hours after the ad um, runs. And that is when it is in the minds of uh, the people who have uh, seen the ad. So the information is more timely. Uh, and this is not unusual. Uh, in our law, we also have the late contribution report, which will later on show up on the final election period reports. So these are those contributions that are over $500 that you receive uh, between four and 14 days prior to the election. On the third day before the election, you have to file the late contribution report. And then you also have to file the next final election period report, which will include these late contributions. So it's not, it's not a standalone uh, unusual situation. I guess I'm wondering what is, uh, so, you know, we're disclosing Sort of real time when we plan to um, put in these ads, um, so that everyone can see that you're going to be spending money to place these ads. Uh, why? Why do? Why is that necessary? Uh, again, it's more recency to when the ads run. I, I think the law can be improved by changing the disclosure date, as was proposed as as was proposed by the. Campaign Spending Commission to uh, after the ad runs, but I, I believe that the law is just to make the 
the information available more uh, uh, more uh, relatable as to when the ad runs, uh, other than waiting to run, and then you wait for the next uh, periodic report. Uh, by that time, maybe no one would might even care about what was spent. This, this brings recency to the reporting. Thank you. Uh, members, any other questions? If not, we'll move on to SB 280 HD1 relating to fair housing reasonable accommodations. First up, we have Hawaii Civil Rights Commission in support. Thank you, Vice Chair. Uh, Bill Hoshijo for the Hawaii Civil Rights Commission. We'll stand on our written testimony in support. Thank you. That's all the testifiers we have, members. Uh, any questions? Report. So report your mask. Mr. Hoshijo. Report yes. your mask. Oh, <clears throat> Mr. Hoshijo, thank you for uh, testifying. Uh, I have one question regarding one phrase in the bill where it says it can be a dog or any other, I forget what it says, any other species. Do you have an example of what any other species might refer to? Could be a cat, rabbit. Um, the thing is the uh, ADA definition of service animal, which does not apply is limited to dogs. Cats, and rabbits? Mostly, or... mostly cats. Mostly cats, okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Members, any other questions? If not, we'll move on to SB 157 relating to licensing. First up, Department of Health and Support. Well, Vice Chair, Chair, members of the committee, Lauren Kim, testifying on behalf of Director of Health and the HR. Uh, the department strongly supports this measure and suggests uh, two amendments to assure that uh, the new subsection B, proposed subsection B, uh, conforms to the rights and privileges that we see in subsection A. Uh, thank you very much for hearing this very important bill. It's a matter of fairness and parity uh, that allows residents and visitors to have choice in who solemnizes their marriage. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, members. Any questions? If seeing none, we'll move on to SB 189 SD1 relating to dog bites. Got three testifiers today. First, Office of the Public Defender in opposition. Oh, I'm sorry. We have no testifiers for this bill. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why it's not listed. Uh, we do have one individual who wrote in in support, though. So we'll move on to SD 428 SD1 relating to felonies. Three testifiers today for this Office of the Public Defender in opposition. Thank you. Uh, William Bento of the Public Defender's Office. Uh, the, our office is in opposition to the bill. It's outlined in our written testimony. And I just want to point out that um, usually for a felony offense, we don't include a reckless state of mind. And I did list the criminal property damage statutes, um, which are consistent with our position. And, and we feel that uh, intentional knowing conduct can be or should be punished by way of a felony, but not reckless conduct when it comes to criminal property damage. And that would be consistent with current statutory law. Uh, and I'm available for any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have HPD in support. Good afternoon, Vice Chair. This is Captain Kunishimo with the Honolulu Police Department. We stand on our written testimony and support and here for any questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And lastly, City and County of Honolulu, Department of Transportation Services. Aloha, Vice Chair. This is Drake Lee from the Department of Transportation Services. And we appreciate that the committee is hearing the, um, this measure. We stand in very strong support. Um, I recognize that in a previous hearing on a similar bill, there were some questions raised by the committee as to the justification for the request for the felony charge. I think we're very open to um, some of the uh, arguments made by the Office of the Public Defender. But basically what we're looking for is, um, you know, just elevating the seriousness of the crime given how many uh, passengers could be affected um, for the safety and security of passengers, not only on the rail, uh, which is an automated uh, public transit operation, but other, you know, looking forward, you know, if we're looking at incorporating um, autonomous vehicles into, you know, our public public transit system, you know, this legislation would really shape um, and support, I think, those sorts of operations that, you know, I think we're a few years away from. So with that, we are available for um, questions. And also, I want to point out that we have um, included in our testimony, um, you know, the, the thought or justification that we had when we asked this bill to be uh, introduced. And that's that, um, you know, criminal tampering is probably what might be charged without 
um, this legislation. And in, in those charges, there's not necessarily that, that risk to the public or passengers on public transit. So that's really our underlying justification for the request for this bill. So we appreciate your consideration. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Uh, members, any questions? Rep Nakamura. Uh, for the public defender, um, Mr. Bento, I wanted to find out, based on your testimony, are you saying that if we took out the word recklessly, just keep it to intentionally and knowingly, that it would be um, preferable and more consistent with existing law? Yes, ma'am. That is our position. Okay, thank you. Mr. Board, did you have a question? Yes. Uh, DTS, please. Yes. As, as the bill presently reads, are there any automated transportation systems that is applicable here? I believe the only one that is currently operating would be the um, the tram shuttle at the Kahului Airport that takes passengers from the main terminal to the consolidated rental car facility. You, you mean the wiki wiki buses at the airport? No, not at the Honolulu International Airport, but at the Kahului International Airport, there is a, a shuttle service that is an automated operation. And I believe that's the only thing that I'm aware of that. Um, Where did you say that is? I, I just, In yeah. Kahului oh. on Maui. Oh, okay. okay. <clears throat> it, but, so it's not just for the anticipated Honolulu Rapid Transit, or even though it most likely would apply to that, correct or not? That's correct. It's not exclusively for the rail. Uh, the question is then, what, what do other states that have real large mass transit systems, do they have similar laws to this? And what is the experience rating of people who try to hijack these things or whatever they do to them that this bill is going to prevent? So we did not investigate how other jurisdictions handle this. What, our, um, what we were looking at was the existing HRS that clarifies that an assault on a public transit operator is, you know, is, would be charged as a class C felony. We wanted to extend that to automated operated uh, public transit services. And what, what is the experience rating of those who are now operating under this? How, how many incidents have occurred? <laughs> Not opinion. Oh, so the Maui one. I guess the Maui one. How many of these things have occurred in Maui? I would need to defer to the State Department of Transportation to answer that. But uh, this is in our experience, based on assaults that occur against bus drivers, and you know, if the bus driver cannot effectively and safely operate the vehicle, it causes the risk to the passengers. We're just concerned about, you know, if, a, if, if the automated operation can be interfered with, that poses the same risk to passengers. So this one covers or a separate uh, statute covers bus drivers? That's correct. Which We're seeking is, to amend that statute. So you want to go from existing bus drivers to automated bus drivers or trams or whatever? Per that's correct. And what are the, what's the incidence of bus drivers being accosted or physically abused? Not I would need to get back to you with that data, but given um, in the period of the pandemic, the incidences of assaults on bus drivers has been elevated. At least verbally, that's for sure. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Okay, thank you, members. Any other questions? Good, seeing none, we'll move on to SB615, SD1, HD1, relating to rentals of mopeds and motor scooters. First up, we have Department of Transportation in support. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair and members, Lena Rocky Regan from the State Department of Transportation. We stand on our written testimony and support and we're available for questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Next up, HPD in support. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, committee members. Uh, HPD stands in our written testimony in support of this bill. We also have a few concerns that are also listed in our testimony. We're available for any questions. Yeah, thank you. Uh, members, we also have a lot of individuals writing in in support, but none present. Uh, any questions? Report. Uh, HPD, how do you distinguish between a rental scooter, a motorcycle, moped, uh, a scooter, et cetera, and a locally owned moped or motorcycle? That, that is one of our concerns. Unless, unless there's specific markings or signage, uh, we would not be able to distinguish it. So it may be a bit difficult to enforce then. 
Yes. Yes, to say the least. Mm. There's no owners of uh, rental agencies because even then enforcing it would be tough. Okay, thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Chair. Any additional questions? Okay, seeing none, we'll move on to SB 153 SD2 relating to the statewide traffic code. First up, Office of the Public Defender in opposition. Good afternoon, it's James Hobbit with the Public Defender's Office. Uh, we are opposed to this bill. The bill basically provides that no person will be able to get their driver's license back unless they show proof of compliance that they had properly installed the interlock system for the uh, period of time. Uh, basically, this bill mandates a punishment that some people cannot comply with. Um, basically, if you don't own a car or don't have access to a car to install such a device, you, you won't be able to get your license back and that's inherently unfair. Um, we acknowledge that driving is a privilege, but that privilege should not apply to only those who can afford uh, the device. Uh, otherwise, uh, we stand on our testimony and we are available for questions. Thank you. Uh, next up, Department of Transportation in opposition. Good afternoon again, Lena Rocky Regan from the State Department of Transportation. We stand on a written testimony in opposition. Um, as provided in our testimony, DOT recommends that the Senate draft to delete at no cost and revert back to its original language, partial financial relief. We also recommend that the effective date be changed to January 1st of 2022. We believe that the state covering an indigent driver's IID related costs would enable violators to continue drinking and driving since there would be no economic consequences. We also believe that our suggested amendment um, as reflected in our testimony will inevitably deter a driver from driving under the influence and reduce recidivism rates and in effect um, reduce motor vehicle fatalities and injuries on Hawaii's roadways. We're available for questions, thank you. Thank you. Next up, prosecutor, Honolulu prosecutors with comments. Okay, not available. Let's see, next up, next up, we have Smart Start LLC in support. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee, Joanne Hamaji Oto. Territory Operations Director for Smart Start LLC, Hawaii Corporate Office. I'm offering testimony in strong support of Senate Bill 153 SD2 with amendments that will allow the state strong indigency program to continue in effect. We are requesting on page three, line 12, to please delete at no cost and to restore partial financial relief and to add an effective date of 2022. This important bill will require interlock users in Hawaii to demonstrate their ability to drive sober before they remove the device. Interlock compliance-based removal is law in 34 states and is important teaching sober driving behavior. Currently, OVUI offenders in Hawaii merely have the interlock removed and when it's time to end the program, whether they have proof sobriety to drive or not. One of the biggest challenges facing Hawaii's interlock program is eligible offenders wait out the replication period and do not install an interlock. Many choose to drive unlicensed and without an interlock. A concern was raised in the previous hearings concerning the cost of the interlock for those that may have trouble paying for it. I would like to assure you that Hawaii's interlock program has an indigent program available for those that qualify to help reduce the cost associated with an interlock. The program has been in place since 2011 and has been working to assist those participants who qualify for financial relief. The Hawaii Department of Transportation established a program to provide for financial relief on the installation, calibration of the related charges to participants that apply for such relief and who are recipients of either food stamps under the SNAP program, free services under the Older Americans Act or Developmentally Disabled Act. I'm happy to further um, speak about the details of the program. Under state law and per contract terms with HDOT, if the participant qualifies for financial relief, the installation and monthly service fees are discounted at 50% off the standard rate. The discounted rate breaks down to the monthly service cost fee to the participants at $1.48 a day. While that is definitely a cost, it is insignificant when compared to the human cost and the risk to our community when a past offender drives before demonstrating that they can do so responsibly. I guess it's, it's a good. Conclude your testimony. 
We strongly urge you to pass Senate Bill 153 SD2 as it will help strengthen Hawaii's interlock program. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony in support of this important bill. Yeah, thank you. Uh, members, we have one individual in support, Melissa Pavlicek. Aloha, my name is Melissa Pavlicek and I'm here today in a personal capacity. I do work with Smart Start on ignition interlock issues here in Hawaii, but my family's personal experience with drunk driving really changed our lives in 1997 when James Steincipher driving at four times the legal blood alcohol limit struck and killed three people we knew. And two of them were adults driving home from purchasing a new car one was an infant, a one-year-old who was ejected from the car during the crash. Their father was driving right behind them on Farrington Highway in Kapolei. It, it forever changed that family and ours, and we strongly support strengthening Hawaii's ignition interlock laws, which will, this bill will do two important things. One, it will eliminate what happens now, which is people with an ignition interlock device can continue to blow in it impaired. While that's good and stops the device stops them from driving, they can then take the device off at the end of their period without having proven they're responsible to drive a car. And secondly, it incentivizes offenders to get the ignition interlock device. They do have a path in this bill to re restoring their driver's license if they simply can't find a vehicle to install the device on or don't own a vehicle themselves, but we strongly support this measure. Thank you. Thank you. And I've been told that the uh, Honolulu Prosecutor's Office is online right now with comments. Uh, good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee, Deputy Prosecutor Trisha Nakamatsu, representing the Honolulu Prosecuting Attorney's Department. Uh, I'm sorry I was having technical difficulties earlier. I just wanted to let you know that I am um, on the call now or on the Zoom now. Uh, we'll stand on our testimony uh, supporting the intent and we are available for questions, if any. Thank you. That's all the testifiers we have. Members, any questions? Report. board. Uh, GOT, please. If this bill were to pass, what is the cost implication that you seem to be objecting to? What, what, it, well, let's begin with the beginning. How many interlocks are out there right now? Do you have any idea? Or maybe that's a mad question. Um, Representative, we have a staff who's um, more of a subject matter expert than I am. So they're available to answer that question, I believe. Sure, put them on. If they are there, are they on? Staff, DOT? Leanne, Robert, I see you're on. Do you want me to repeat the question? Yes, please. The first question led to the second. The first question was, if this bill passes and DOT is required to purchase the interlock, how much is it going to cost? Then that led to, well, how many interlocks are actually out there right now as a quantitative uh, measurement of how often this has been implemented? I know staff is available. I'm not sure if they're having technical difficulties, but um, my records show that uh, there were 10 indigent offenders in 2020. So the total cost at half price um, would be 5970. Um, it would cost to have it installed and deinstalled would cost $63 each and to pay for the maintenance for a year would cost 534. So I'm sorry, may I, may I answer that question for you? I have the exact numbers for you. That okay, you're please. Okay, currently right now, there are about a 980 active interlocks on the road, that's statewide. So that, 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 that number represents how many um, interlocks we have installed in the car today that is active on Hawaii's roads. Um, the indigent program gives, um, as I previously mentioned, 50% off to the standard fees of, of the interlock, which currently right now is $89 a month. So it comes out to 40, uh, 50 percent off, which is forty-four dollars and fifty cents a month for the indigent program. Um, currently, um, to date, since 2011, since the start of the program, we've had 94 participants that have requested for that for the partial financial relief. So the question is, what if this bill passes? Will be the financial 
impact or the amount of money that you have to come up with. It, if it's $59 and $89, it doesn't sound like it's going to break the bank. Right. So we, we, so it's $89. That's the standard fee. The indigent participant pays $44.50, which is 50% off that $89. And then we absorb the rest of the cost. So total absorption would be how much? $44.50 of, of that $89 Given every the, month. Of how many you've had in the past and how many you We've were... had 94 participants that have requested over, for the indigent program. Over a period of time, was that not was that not the case? Or is that was just the last year? Um that is over 20 over from the program start. So that's from 2011. 2011. Okay, thank you very yes. much. Uh, any other questions? Tokyo, go. Yes, hi. Um, should probably either be for Joanne or um, Melissa. So, um, the person who committed, the, who got the DUI, they're paying for it, whether they're in, indigent or whoever it is, they have to pay, right? Yes. Rep Tokyo, good. This bill had a, an amendment made to it in the Senate to make it free for certain indigent offender, offenders. And I think it would solve the DOT's testimony and it would help change behavior if the indigent offenders still paid a small amount because you really want that engagement and that $1.48 a day payment that they currently paid. As Joanne mentioned, very few people currently use the indigent program, but it is there and it is available for them. And if someone was truly not able to afford to operate a vehicle, then they could still have a path to eventually getting their license back. But this would help ensure safety by having the current indigent program, which is working very well, continue to stay in place. It was my understanding that there was an amendment. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Rachel. Any other questions from Nakamura? Uh, for the participating attorney's office, um, you, you stated some of the concerns in your testimony, and I just wanted to clarify: what are, um, are you are you recommending amendments, or are you recommending deferral? Uh, I think at this time our preference would be deferral, only to give. Although we think that the bill might be on the right track, there's just not enough time to get all of the stakeholders. Um, particularly all of the police departments and prosecutors together as would be uh, preferred um, as was done with the prior working group when really comprehensive amendments could be made, making sure you really dot your I's, cross your T's, all of the different sections that need to be changed can actually get those amendments done all at the same time rather than trying to do things piecemeal here, piecemeal there, oh, we have to come back and fix five other things next year because it wasn't done right the first time. We really feel that if you're going to be making these changes, and we, we agree that compliance-based enforcement um, is a good thing, generally speaking, um, the way you do it, it's always the devil's in the details, right? You just making sure you do it the right way, um, and we don't feel that it's there yet. Um, that said, if the committee really just wanted to plow through and move forward with this version, we did have one amendment, I think, uh, towards the very end of our testimony. That was the one thing that we were able to Thank you. Not for now. But there would be other shortcomings. I think it didn't mention anything about the revocations for say ADLRO, administrative revocations. Um, it just made the one change in 291E61 for now, as far as doubling the revocation period. Um, that was another thing just off the top of our heads that we noticed. Thank you. Okay. But Thank didn't you. offhand know how to put those changes in. Members, any other questions? I'm sorry. Good afternoon. This is Ian Yamamoto with DOT. I'm so sorry. I believe one of the representatives answers that he's looking for is, well, based on the 10 indigent offenders that we have in 2020, um, the cost would be um, about 5,970. It's based on that number. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank let's you. move on to SB 726 relating to policing. First up, we have the Attorney General's Office in opposition. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee, Deputy Attorney General Albert Cook for the state, uh, for the Department of Attorney General. The department opposes this bill as explained in our written testimony for two main reasons. 
First, that the bill is strict bright line wait time before entering a dwelling with uh, to execute a judicially approved search warrant would place officers at risk. Um, second, that the Hawaii Revised Statutes and the Hawaii Supreme Court have placed ample safeguards protecting an individual's right to privacy. And the court's reasonableness standard gives law enforcement and the courts the needed flexibility to address each unique factual situation that may arise in the serving of a court authorized search warrant. Uh, so therefore, we don't believe that this bill is necessary. Um, I'm available for any questions, if, um, if any. Yeah, thank you. Next up, Office of the Public Defender in support. Mr. Tabe, are you there? I'm there. Sorry, I was muted. Um, again, James Tabe with the Public Defender's Office. We generally support this bill. We do believe that uh, when executing warrants, officers should, should be in uniform and they should be displaying their agencies. Uh, we do have some concerns, however, with the 30 second time limit or the, the period that's suggested in this bill. Um, in, I think in many instances, the uh, especially when warrants are served in early morning hours, 30 seconds is, is simply not going to be reasonable enough. I mean, a recent Supreme Court case, which I referred to in my uh, written testimony, uh, 25 seconds in that situation, and that involved a modest sized home, uh, in the, and then the warrant was served in the early morning hours, that was not reasonable. I'm afraid that if you set 30 seconds as a uh, right line rule, like uh, Mr. Cook has mentioned, the uh, I'm afraid that police officers may just take it, they're going to wait for the 30 seconds and think that's reasonable, uh, which it will not be. And uh, what will end up happening is if they enter too soon, uh, if they don't wait a reasonable amount of time. Uh, and as from the prosecutor's point of view, it, the evidence is just going to get thrown out at that point. So uh, we do uh, support the intent of this bill. I think uh, it's in, in the right direction. Uh, we just think that um, 30 seconds is just not enough. We are available for questions. Yeah, thank you. Uh, next up, we have HPD in opposition. Aloha Chair, Vice Chair, and members of the committee. I'm Acting Major Shelley Paiva of the Specialized Services Division. The HPD stands in opposition of this bill as we feel that no knock warrants are already prohibited under the HRS section number 803-37. Um, also in regards to the Hawaii Supreme Court ruling in that particular case, yes, 25 seconds was, um, they had deemed was not enough time. However, overall, the Hawaii Supreme Court has says that a reasonable amount of time is necessary, which is based on uh, case by case um, circumstances and whatever is given to us at the time um, of the preparation of the execution of the search warrant. Um, we stand on our written testimony that we have submitted and I am here for any questions. Yeah, thank you. Next up, Hawaii Harm Health and Harm Reduction Center in support. Good afternoon, Vice Chair uh, Matayoshi, Chair Nakashima and members. My name is Nico Sleverins, uh, testifying on behalf of Hawaii Health and Harm Reduction Center and Drug Policy Forum of Hawaii. Uh, we strongly support this bill. Um, we believe we're, we're grateful that we don't have the situation uh, that we do on the continent where, you know, we have violent uh, police raids that results in the deaths of individuals. Um, and this would codify uh, existing practice about not, not uh, you know, barging into people's homes. Uh, we also support uh, the, the use of uniformed officers in the, in the execution of warrants as we have a lot of limited English proficient people in throughout our state actually. So uh, we, we strongly support this bill and uh, we thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony. Thank you. Next up we have ACLU of Hawaii in support. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee. Mandy Fernandez on behalf of the ACLU of Hawaii. We strongly support this bill. Just over a year ago, Brianna Taylor was murdered in her own home in Louisville, Kentucky during a botched no-knock raid by plainclothes police officers. While Ms. Taylor's murder was re renewed national attention on the issue of no-knock warrants and raids, she's far from the first victim of this practice, which has racist roots and is disproportionately deployed against communities of color. 
No knock and quick knock raids rely on surprise and increase the probability of violence. If somebody suddenly forced their way into your home uh, early in the morning while you were sleeping, you would reasonably believe they were burglars and react to defend your family, which is exactly what happened in Brianna Taylor's case. SB 726 would not only expressly prohibit no knock warrants, but it would also create the baseline period of time for how long officers must wait before forcing their way onto a property when executing a warrant. There seems to be some confusion about this. So it's important to note that 30 seconds is just the minimum. It's just the, ba the baseline. And the bill would still allow the courts to determine that based on the facts and circumstances of a specific case, more time than 30 seconds was necessary to meet that constitutional standard of reasonableness. The bill also requires officers to serve warrants in uniform, which is necessary so they are clearly identifiable, preventing further confusion and to reduce the chances of violent interactions. I will note in response to testimony from the police and from the attorney general, as written, the bill does account for situations where officers may need to enter a property sooner than 30 seconds. And while we would ideally like to see these exigent circumstances narrowed further to only life-threatening situations, the exception that's been established in case law, which is reflected in the bill's language, allows for a situation where there's a threat to life or property or the destruction of evidence. So this concern is already adequately addressed by the bill's language. We sincerely hope you move this forward in Breonna Taylor's memory. We shouldn't have to wait for tragedy to strike in Hawaii before we take action. We're available for any questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Next up, we have Community Alliance on Prisons in Support. Aloha Chair Matayoshi and members of the committee, Kat Brady testifying in strong support of this measure. Um, we note that 17 states do not allow this tactic. And we also point in our testimony on page two, um, New York, um, they just introduced a bill and we respectfully ask the committee to amend the bill to actually ban the, in, the issuance of no-knock warrants in the cases of drug raids. That's where they're mostly used. And, you know, as Coretta Scott King said, justice is never advanced in the taking of human life. And we hope that the committee moves this measure. Thank you so much for hearing it. Aloha. Thank you, members. We have a number of individuals uh, submitting testimony in support. We have four scheduled to be here today. First up, we have Emma Shirai in support. Aloha Chair Nakashima, Vice Chair Matayoshi, and the members of the JHA community. My name is Emma Shirai, and I'm in strong support of SB 726. In the wake of the police shooting of a child on Kalakaua Avenue and the murder of Breonna Taylor, at the hands of the Minneapolis Police Department, I'm appalled and deeply disturbed by the amount of police violence that our Black and Pacific Islander citizens face in the nation at large and right here at home. This isn't simply an issue on the continent or one that we can stand to ignore. I ask that the members of the committee do not stand by till an innocent is shot by an officer in their own home to take action. We don't have to wait to prevent a tragedy like Breonna Taylor's death from happening here in our own community. Human life must be worth more to the police than evidence. Thank you so much for allowing me the time to testify. And again, I strongly urge you to pass SB 726 to protect the people of Hawaii and the people around you. Thank you. Next up, we have Juliana Davis in support. Aloha Chair Nakashima, Vice Chair Mariyoshi, and JHA committee members. My name is Juliana Davis and I'm testifying today as an individual in full support of SB 726, also known as Brianna's Law. As you all know, Brianna's Law was introduced as a way for Hawaii to honor the life of Brianna Taylor, the 26-year-old Black woman who was murdered while sleeping in her own home. Brianna Taylor was an EMT, she was a daughter, she was a friend, and she was a woman whose life was stolen from her by a police officer in a botched no-knock drug raid in Louisville, Kentucky. Last year, I attended a march for Brianna Taylor and for Black Lives here in Honolulu, and it was so empowering to be in community with the thousands of folks that want to honor and uplift her life. Months later, the legislature too has the opportunity to honor the life of Breonna Taylor by passing SB 726 in its current form. Here in Hawaii, folks often like to act like we don't need action, like we don't need racial justice, and like we don't need police accountability. I've even heard Breonna's law referred to as a mainland issue because no-knock raids are not very prevalent here in the Hawaiian Islands. 
And today I ask you, do we need to wait until police officers murder innocent civilians while carrying out the duties of the carceral state? Or do we need to act now in order to prevent that from happening in the first place? We need Brianna's law passed now to ensure that the lives of Hawaii residents are protected against police violence, like the violence that stole Brianna Taylor's life. We can no longer push off police accountability because police violence is already at Hawaii's door. Please vote yes on SB 726 in its current form. Mahalo for your time and thank you for the opportunity to testify. Hey, thank you. Next up we have Shana. Oh boy, this is gonna be rough. Lono Anea, Anea Alexander. Ah, uh, Shana, you're muted. I'm oh, sorry, we're, we're unable to, there's no audio coming through. You know, I'm, I'm gonna go to the next person and we'll come back to you. Hopefully you can uh, get it fixed. Okay, we'll move on briefly to Mark Want in support, not here. Okay, Shana, I guess it's you. It looks like Shane is having technical difficulties. Um, no sound coming through, but she is in support of this measure. Uh, members, any questions? Rev Nakamura. Yes, um, I have a question for the public defenders. Um, you um, testified in support of this bill, but have concerns about the 30 second uh, provision and was wondering um, what what do you propose to address your concerns? Do you do you want to go back to the reasonable um, definition? Uh, thank you for the question, Representative. Yes, I, I think thirty seconds is 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 arbitrary. Um, I know twenty five seconds is uh, like we said in that case, and it's it's not a very big home that that the um, in, in the facts of that case. So I think 30 seconds is just too short. Now, I don't know whether we should say, you know, I cannot stand here or sit here and say one minute, two minutes or whatever time period. Uh, the Supreme Court has, you know, addressed this issue and, and, and did indicate a reasonable time. I mean, I guess you can fashion, I know the other uh, testifiers would like 30 seconds a reasonable time with a minimum of 30 seconds maybe or something to that effect but i do think it's uh, uh it should be emphasized that it should be a reasonable amount of time or something consistent with state v nail all uh, of the language uh, that's found in, in the supreme court case and um can I ask one more question right here uh, so there are other testifiers who are saying that uh, this bill is not needed that under um current laws can address the situation. Do you agree with that? No, I do think it's 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 needed. I think it should be clarified uh, that we should have a waiting period, that there should be, we should be batting no knock warrants and, and there should be, people should wait. And um, uh, so I, I disagree that, it, you know, with those that says it's not needed, respectfully disagree. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Thank you, and then it looks like Shana might have her audio working. Shana, why don't we give your testimony one more try? <clears throat> okay, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Okay, awesome, thank you. Aloha, Chair and Committee members. Uh, my name is Shana Lona I Alexander, and I'm testifying as an individual in strong support of SB 726. I first want to lift up how a child who was senselessly killed on Tala Powell yesterday for a car, a possession that is replaceable while this child's life is not, like how Brianna Taylor is not replaceable, how no one in our communities is replaceable. Hands up, don't shoot is a rally cry we hear every time we've taken to the streets for black lives. Brianna Taylor wasn't even afforded the chance to raise her hands and show how she was unarmed and innocent before she was gunned down in her sleep. It worries me that Brianna's law is the only police reform bill to make it this far in session. I believe it speaks to the worrying increased militarization of Hawaii's police. We've seen this in police departments acquiring military type weapons and training and tools. The arrests and tactics used against 
demonstrations on Mauna Kea, Kuhupu, Waimanalo, Black Lives Matter protests here only prove this. This growing militaristic culture and policing has led to scandal after scandal from cops abusing CARES Act funding to COVID-19 enforcement and empowers cops to speak out against transparency, safety, and accountability reforms. And clear evidence is presented that cops have and continue to abuse people's rights and harm and cause harm in Native Hawaiian, Samoan, and Micronesian communities. Brianna's law can't and won't bring us the justice that Brianna, that her mother, that that 16 year old that we need, we deserve so much more and better, but it will be a step in ensuring that we're a little more safe in our homes tonight. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, members, any further questions? Rep. Okay. Yes, um, I don't know if it was for the prosecutor's office or um, the uh, police department, but if we're talking about the time period, the 30 seconds, uh, Ms. Paiva, um, you said in your testimony that they knocked three times before they enter. So my question is, if you had to guess, what is that time period in between the time they knock and the time before they enter the, the property if nobody answers? And I can understand from your testimony the different things that can happen in 30 seconds. So, you know, we want to protect our police officers too, but... Um, if you had to guess, Ms. Paiva, what would you say is that time is? And then, you know, now I'm assuming that all the officers have a vest on when they go into these um, properties. Um, do those vests signify police? Is that enough as far as identifying their, their uniform? Um, so can you help me with that, uh, Major Paiva? Yes, um, I can answer that question. Um, actually, since this bill has come up, we've, act, we've been um, training and timing to see how long a normal three knock, three announce would take. And it takes anywhere between 25 to 35 seconds. Now, we do knock and announce three times before we begin to make entry. So it's not necessarily that the entry is made at the 30 second. 25 second mark. That's when we are attempting to try to open the door if the door has not been open. It could take us another 30 seconds on top of that to actually make the entry. Um, so just like everything else, I would say on, on average, the first three knock and announces that we do make is anywhere between 25 and 30 seconds, depending on um, the officer that is conducting the knock and announce. And then you add on time after that for the amount of time it actually takes to make the entry into the place. As far as the uniforms for the Specialized Services Division, which is um, better known as um, our SWAT team, um, we are fully dressed in TAC gear. We have helmets. Um, we have police on our um, shoulders, on our patches on our front and the back. Um, we are very noticeable um, as far as um, having the word police and, and knowing that it is the police. Um, every unit within our department has an authorized uniform. So um, no matter what, who is going out there to execute these warrants, we do the high risk warrants. There's other uh, units that will do other non high risk um, search warrants and they'll have their uniform that has to show um, their uh, department, it'll say police, it'll have to have their badge on it and they'll have to have um, their ID. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vice President. Members, any other questions? Okay, seeing none, I have one for HPD. Uh, in the last five or 10 years, uh, depending on what information you have available to you, how many no-knock warrants have you requested and how many have been issued? We have been looking and um, doing a lot of research since this bill has come up. And um, we are not able to find any no-knock warrants that um, the HPD has executed or um, um, been approved by the prosecuting office, uh, prosecuting attorney's office, or a judge. Okay, thank you. Uh, seeing no further questions, uh, we will recess for decision making. Recess.
Yeah, coming back to decision making to be on judiciary in Hawaiian affairs. It's Tuesday, April 6, 2021. We are in room uh, 325. Okay, members, um, first on the agenda is SB 404 relating to election theory communications. Um, Uh, first amendment um, on page uh, one line six, uh, the the fine amount. Uh, I am going to uh, set it at one thousand uh, dollars. It's, it's kind of going all over the place. Uh, on page two, uh, line seventeen to twenty, um, and on page. Uh, Three lines four. I uh, want to remove all references to the candidate committees. So we're eliminating candidate committees from the bill. Um, page four, uh, line three to four. I want to restore the original language in the bill, which um, makes the reporting requirement back to uh, the time when the uh, the uh, contract was cut or the uh, payment was made as opposed to um, when it is released publicly. Uh, page four, line six to 12, I'm gonna delete the new language uh, in there that replaced the original language. Uh, page five, line 17 to 19, uh, again, restoring the original language on electronic uh, election communications are, um, or restoring the original language. And then um, technical amendments need for clarity, consistency, and style. Also, I want to note in the committee report um, election year communications are meant to expose non candidate influences on elections that have uh, shown to radically influence the outcome of elections in the state. Members, any questions or comments? I see none, Vice Chair, with amendments. Okay, Chair's recommendation is to pass SB 404, HD1, with amendments. Uh, Chair and Vice Chair vote aye. Rep re sorry, Rep Uchiyama. Aye. Rep Kobayashi. Aye. Rep Lopresti. Rep Lowen. Aye. Rep McKelvey. Aye. Rep Nakamura. Aye. Rep Takumi. Aye. Rep Todd. Aye. Rep Tokioka. Rep board. Full House, your, rep, your rep, uh, recommendation is adopted. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, SB 8, uh, 280, House Draft 1, related to fair housing, uh, to fair housing reasonable accommodations. Um, members, uh, kind of going around back and forth on this, the uh, chair has decided that. Um, on page six, line 15, we shall change shall to may. And I will note that it already has a defective effective date. So it's one, one word change, shall to may. Remember the questions or comments? So you done, Vice Chair, as a group. Chair's recommendation is to pass SB 280 HD1 with amendments, noting the presence of all members. Anyone voting with reservations? Anyone voting no? Chair, your recommendation is adopted. KSB 157 related to licensing. Um, members, I'm going to recommend that we adopt the uh, DOH amendments uh, uh, presented in their testimony and um, and a cost for the civil license to be $100 a year. Members, any questions or comments? Seeing none, Vice Chair as amended. Chair's recommendation is to pass SB 157 with amendments only the presence of all members. Anyone voting with reservations? Any members voting no? Chair, your recommendation is adopted. Thank you very much. Um, Chamber 189, SD1, you need to fight. Uh, Chair's recommendation is uh, that we effect dated to July 1st, 2021. 
members, any questions or comments? Seeing none, uh, Vice Chair as amended. Chair's recommendation is best SB 189 SD1 with amendments under the presence of all members. Anyone voting with reservations? Any members voting no? Chair, recommendation is adopted. Thank you very much. SB 428 SD1 relates to felonies. Um, you members, uh, after the uh, uh, first hearing on this bill and um, it was subsequent request that the bill be heard, uh, that this bill be heard. Uh, you know, the chair did ask the um, uh, Department of Transportation Services to relook at the bill and discuss with their prosecutor the uh, appropriate uh, penalty for what they were describing. And uh, you know, I, I'm still unsatisfied with the uh, response that came back. So. Chair will recommend deferral of this merit of the proposal. Um, SB 651, SD1, HD1 relate to rentals of mopeds and motor scooters. Uh, Chair's recommendation is that the bill be amended to require uh, flags on uh, rental motor uh, scooters. Uh, other technical amendments need for clarity, consistency, and style. There was any questions or comments? Uh, yes. Yeah, I have a little concern about the flag requirement because in our area, in the Poly Highway, we have wind issues and they don't purposely do not put flags on the mopeds because it can cause riders to crash. And, and uh, we've had several incidents of it, including recently, uh, some one even fatal. So uh, I'm gonna have to go with reservations because we see what will happen in conference committee. Maybe you can maybe you can look at it in the conference committee again. Yeah, you, we, we talked about uh, other other forms of other things like stickers and things like that, but it seems like the flag was the most visible. Yeah, but for our area, it's kind of a danger because a mandate could be. Oh, we can we can discuss it more before conference. Yeah, in conference that'd be great. Okay, thank you. Any other? Reservations, comments? Okay, if not, uh, Vice Chair, uh, as amended. Chair's recommendation is passed SB 615, SD1, HD1, with amendments during the presence of all members and the reservations of Rep. Kelby. Any other members voting with reservations? Any members voting no? Chair, your recommendation is adopted. Okay, SB uh, 153, SD2, related to the statewide traffic code. Um, I would like to recommend that we uh, adopt the uh, Honolulu Prosecutor's Amendments uh, that any vehicle operated by the driver be it's, uh, fitted with a um, interlock device. Um, it's going to change the Senate's language of doubling the revocation period for those who do not own a vehicle to a two-year revocation period for those who do not own a vehicle uh, in which to place an ignition interlock device. On page three, lines 12 to 13, uh, I'm gonna revert, uh, revert back to the original language of the bill and other technical amendments needed for clarity, consistency, and style. Yeah, yeah, the two year revocation for those who do not own a vehicle. No, no, it's just one of those. Okay, members, any other questions? Any questions or comments? Being done, Vice Chair has amended. Chair's recommendation is passed SB 153, SD2, with amendments noting the presence of all members. Any members voting with reservations? Any members voting no? Chair, recommendation is adopted. Thank you very much. SB 726 relates to policing. Um, uh, Chair notes that the bill kind of alternates between loud voice and audible voice. And so I'm going to um, indicate that the term audible voice should be used throughout the bill. Um, 
I'm going to create an allowance for officers to forego the 30 second waiting if indigent uh, circumstances exist. And that uh, this change should be made, also be made throughout the bill. And I will also note that indigent, uh, exigent uh, circumstances may not always exist, and exceptions must be allowed. Um, I have uh, um, officers in authorized uniform uh, to be dressed in authorized uniforms. We're going to uh, mandate that anytime that uh, a no knock warrant is executed, uh, body cams should be mandatory and effect date to July 1st, 3021. Members, any questions or comments? Seeing none, Vice Chair as amended. Chair's recommendation is to pass SB 726 with amendments, noting the presence of all members. Any members voting with reservations? Represent reservations, Rep Tokyo. Okay. Any other members voting with reservations? Any members voting no? Chair, your recommendation is adopted. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, members. This is our last uh, bill hearing. We are adjourned.